And joining us now is Admiral James Tabidis, former NATO Supreme Allied Commander, and Jeremy Bash, former Chief of Staff to Leon Panetta at the CIA and the Pentagon. First to you, Admiral, uh, let's talk about, first of all, Vladimir Putin telling Mario Draghi in, an, in a call that it's premature to talk about a ceasefire or a meeting with Zelensky. This is certainly pouring cold water on any optimism out of those talks in Turkey. Indeed. And um, all of a piece with Putin, he is always one to try and get inside his opponent's decision cycle. And the minute he saw over the last few days some little tiny green shoots of at least a bit of communication in, in Turkey. And by the way, we ought to give credit to the Turks for moving this uh, negotiation, if you will, along. The minute Putin saw um, a little tiny bit of uh, let's go back and forth, he's going to immediately throw cold water on it, as you said. And um, he knows his plan A has failed. He's not going to be able to sweep across uh, the nation of Ukraine as vast as it is and decapitate Zelensky. So he's thinking ahead a couple of moves to plan B, which I suspect is going to be to truly consolidate Russian control over a land bridge from Russia down to Crimea, continue to support these little faux republics, Luhansk and Donetsk, and pound Mariupol, which is the fly in his ointment right in the middle of that land bridge he wants to connect. He's going to continue to confound us. Um, he's tactically smart, but he's failing strategically here. And I don't think the outcome is ultimately going to be successful for Russia. But at what cost, of course, again, given his track record of what he does when he is cornered. Uh, Jeremy Bash, so today Russia's spokesman <laughs> Peskov was responding to the claims that was, were put out very clearly by U.S. intelligence and also then by U.K. intelligence, that Putin is detached from his advisors, he's not listening or not getting advice, they maybe aren't able, able to give him information from the battlefront, and he doesn't really know what's happening on the ground. It seems to me that there are, there's a head game going on here. It could be absolutely accurate, most likely is accurate, but it's also to get under his skin and tell this former KGB guy, you don't even know what's going on. Um, Peskov was denying it, of course, and pushing back hard. Yeah, I think it's an enormous indictment of the commander-in-chief of the Russian Federation, of Vladimir Putin, that he is not even getting the ground truth from his own troops. And so he, therefore, is not able in any way, shape, or form to command the operation on the ground. He doesn't know whether or not his troops are succeeding or they're failing. He doesn't know where to drive his resources. He doesn't know whether or not his troops are actually more in danger than they're claiming. He's shooting the messenger. He's not willing to hear any bad news. And this showcases exactly how broken his chain of command is. It's why they've been having these major failures on the battlefield. And I think the West and the Ukrainians can exploit this. They can exploit this two ways, by disrupting further the command and control, by, by engaging in, in operations that, that confuse and confound the, the military leadership, but also significantly, Andrea, I would say, by declassifying this intelligence, showing the world just how disconnected Vladimir Putin is. It's not only getting under his skin, but it's undermining him on the world stage. And, Admiral, though, Ukraine's leaders are still trying to adjust to this, to the potential ramping up of Russian forces in the east without shifting some of the manpower that has fortified Kyiv. So are they going to get stretched too thin? Um, they will be challenged. But here's some good news. You know, in a military parlance, they enjoy the interior lines of communication, which simply means the Russians have swooped. Jeremy, we're going to fix yeah. the admiral's, uh, but you know from the, your Pentagon days what he's talking about, that they can communicate internally. And Yeah, the, the Ukrainians have this enormous Russians advantage, can't. and the Russians are, as the invading force, they're going to have to penetrate lines of communication. They're going to have to, in effect, try to figure out how to get inside out, as Admiral Stavridis was talking about. But I think this goes... To, to prove the, the larger point here, which is that the Russian military is failing almost on all levels. And it also shows why the reporting from the field that we saw uh, earlier from Mali and others showcases that, that these, these 
humanitarian corridors that have been much talked about in the international media are really fraudulent, Andrea. There's no way that the Russians are allowing their civilian hostages to leave peacefully. And so I think all of this talk about a peace process or dialogue, I kind of agree with Vladimir Putin and I agree with Zelensky. <laughs> it's all premature. This is a major moment for the West and the Ukrainians to drive harder at the Russians. And I think the U.S. and the West will be accelerating their military support for Ukraine. Well, to that very point, today, President Zelensky, Admiral, and I know thanks that we got you back, gave three separate addresses to lawmakers in Belgium. And I understand that the Admiral's video just went down, so we're going we're gonna to fix this, we hope. But so he gave Jeremy uh, Zelensky three separate addresses. So he was addressing military leaders, uh, lawmakers in Belgium, Australia, and the Netherlands. He's complaining that he's not getting supplies, supplies fast enough. And it goes all the way back to saying that he should have been getting those stingers and javelins before the invasion. They should have been supplied. And they're running through them. Yeah. You know, a thousand missiles a day. Well, first, kudos to him because he's, do, he's walking that fine line, Andrea. He is, he is out there as the spokesperson, as the face of the Ukrainian resistance, of the face of the Ukrainian military. And he's putting the, you know, he's putting the world's... Uh, powers, including the countries you've referenced, on notice that he needs more. They, what they've done is terrific, but he needs more. And I think that's exactly where the pressure ought to be, is frankly the message he delivered to our own Congress the week before last. And as you saw that very day, President Biden stepped up and responded with a billion uh, dollars of more security assistance. That's what the way the world is going to have to go in responding. There's no way the Russians are backing down. And I think uh, support for Ukraine is going to be uh, an enduring feature of this security landscape for the foreseeable future. And Admiral Stavides is back with us. Admiral, we've been talking, Jeremy has been filling in manfully about, you know, what you would have said, because we can all channel, and he especially, as a former Pentagon chief of staff, can channel what you're talking about, the comms. But we were also raising the issue of Zelensky's appeals to three countries today, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Australia, for more supplies. And then that, this goes back to his complaint that they didn't get the stingers before the invasion, that they should have had the javelins and everything, you know, lined up. They want more. You're hearing on the Hill at the briefing for the Senate yesterday, uh, Lindsey Graham and other critics, and this is partly politics, they're saying it's not going out fast enough. The Pentagon says it is. Uh, the truth is somewhere in the middle. It always is. But um, clearly, we could have got more there back to the Trump administration and the withholding, shamefully, of the javelins over political dirt digging. Um, we could, um, in this administration, have moved with more alacrity last fall. But look, let's play the ball from where it is on the field. Let's get them the ammunition. As Churchill said um, in the run-up to World War II, give us the tools, we will solve the problem. So the Ukrainians are willing. We need to amp it up in every dimension. I'm confident this administration is seized with doing that. And um, if we do that, I think there's every expectation that Putin is not going to be able to complete plan A that we've talked about. He'll have to fall back to plan B. Now you're in a negotiation. You can start to see the outlines of a deal at some point. And Admiral, I wanted to point out something that caught my attention from our colleague Ali Velshi in the Maddow show last night, which was uh, the reporting that NBC did back in, you know, when Putin was invading Chechnya. Now, it started with his predecessor. It started under Boris Yeltsin. He sent the tanks into Chechnya nearly three decades ago. But then when it was not going well, he brought in Vladimir Putin as the new prime minister. And then he spent more than eight years leveling the place with mercilessly. And that's really his M.O., is when he's not winning on the ground, he just takes to the air and bombs the heck out of it. That's exactly right. And it, th he has many other dirty tricks up his sleeve to include the long range fires you just mentioned, possible amphibious assault to go around behind the Ukrainians and come up from the sea. Um, he could use a chemical weapon. He's flooding in this terrible Wagner group, mercenaries, Chechens, uh, Syrians. He's got a whole bag of dirty tricks. He's going to continue to pull them out. Uh, Jeremy knows this well from his days at the agency and in our work together at defense. Um, do not underestimate Vladimir Putin. He has a ways to go yet, unfortunately. 
And we do have breaking news for both of you. The CIA just announcing that Director Bill Burns has tested positive for COVID. Director Burns is fully vaccinated. He was boosted, and he saw President Biden yesterday morning during a socially distanced briefing. Uh, he was wearing an N95 mask during that meeting, according to his office. We know, uh, Jeremy, you know the uh, CIA director so well, and you, of course, were chief of staff at CIA. He is working from home, so he's no longer briefing the president in person, but working from home. Yeah, Andrew, first of all, I think the, the, the issue here is he's going to be able to discharge his duties, and he's playing an absolutely indispensable role in collecting intelligence and analyzing it, presenting it to the president, and also conducting other special activities, as they say, uh, with respect to the, the war effort. But the real question is, you know, how, how is the White House going to be able to navigate this little boomlet of, of COVID outbreak that we're, we're, we're noticing uh, when the president himself, obviously, is someone they're trying to protect? Um, and, and there's no substitute for these face-to-face -face conversations. But given technology today, they can hold NSC meetings with a lot of people on virtual teleconferences with classified systems. So I don't think this will in any way disrupt our prosecution of the war effort, but it is something that, obviously, right. White House officials are going to watch carefully. Sure, after the press secretary and then the deputy press secretary, the, they've, they've seen uh, how careful they have to be. I guess it's just another argument for vaccinations. We'll talk about that later when we talk about COVID. And thanks to you, Admiral Stavides. Thanks so much for being with us today. And, of course, my pal here, Jeremy.